a glimpse of that love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. that I forgot to add to the prayer list that I want to mention for you all to be praying about. Um, uh, Audrey Kramers, uh, she, she texted me yesterday. She said her sister-in-law's uh, mother, Rue Briley, is in the hospital with internal bleeding. She has two, she's had two blood transfusions as of yesterday, and uh, she has heart congestion. So we definitely will be praying for her. Um, I want to be lifting her up. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to forget about that So before we, before we ran on from that. Well, um, into the new year. We have made it into a new year, um, and man, do we have some high hopes for this new year, don't we? Um, as, as you go into a new year, sometimes you kind of look back, and maybe you even look even further back than just the past year. Sometimes you, maybe coming off of Christmas, you know, there's a lot of different nostalgic things that happen, a lot of things that kind of bring up memories of childhood and stuff like that. And, and uh, recently, as I was kind of preparing for this this morning, and as I was thinking back over the year and the past years and stuff, I got to start, uh, th- I began to kind of have a little bit of nostalgia and thinking back to past uh, times. When I was a kid, um, we would we would go to my grandmother's out in Harrisonburg. If you don't know where Harrisonburg is, it's out in the western part of the state. Um, we would go out there. At, uh, there was a, she lived on a farm uh, that my dad grew up on, and they had the hills. And man, whenever it would snow, that was the best place because you got to go sledding on the hills. We won't talk about the fact that it was out in a cow field and you know what all that means, but um, you can draw your own conclusions. Um, but it was snowy, so it was cold and things were hard. We'll, we'll leave it at that, okay? Um, but I got to sled, and as a kid, um, one of the things that I'd love to do was to pretend like I was a bobsledder, especially there, because, you know, they would get maybe a, sometimes a foot of snow, and so you could kind of get some good corners built up, and I could get some good banks on those hills and stuff. And as a kid, bobsledders were some of my heroes. I would watch those, those guys. When I was a kid, that's when Cool Runnings, the movie, came out. If you've never seen Cool Runnings, you've got to go see it. It's one of my favorite all-time movies. Um, it's just so great. But anyways, when I was a kid, I, I looked up to those bobsledders letters, and I thought they were awesome. They, they were some of my heroes. Who, who are some of your heroes? Think about that for a second. Maybe as a child, who are some of your heroes? Maybe even now, who are some of your heroes right now? Uh, and someone else that, uh, kind of a group of people that when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I thought they were awesome. I'm still enamored and just enthralled with, uh, with fighter jets. Um, during Venus's father's funeral, we were like, I think the entire squ- squadron at Langley Air Force Base took off right behind us um, over at the cemetery there. That wasn't the best time. I wasn't excited about the fighter jets right then, but, um, but I love to just watch them. I love to watch the jets. I love to, to think about, you know, uh, of being up in there and being a pilot and stuff. When, when I was a kid, I also uh, thought I, I, I was going to be a rock star one day. I'd love to kind of have my guitar in my bedroom and jam away on these different things. Man, we, we have these, these visions, these, these people that we look up to and we emulate and we want to be like, and we think, oh, it would be so awesome to try and, and be like that person or that type of person, that, that, that style or whatever it might be. A lot of times when we think of our heroes, we think of the things that we want that are in their characteristics that we want in our life. Sometimes we think of heroes that are strong, Sometimes we think of heroes that are courageous. Sometimes we think of ones that are smart or wise or maybe rich or just well accomplished. And we can think of so many different things that when we see in those people, we think that's what I want. I want to be like that. I, that's my hero. People who will have these attributes that, that we aspire to, they become our heroes many times. Well, as, as God's people, we wear a title nowadays. We wear this, this, this title, this name of Christian. And for some people, when they hear that name Christian, there's some baggage that comes with it. For some people, they hear the name Christian, the title Christian, and maybe they think of past experiences with a church that didn't go so well. Maybe they think of past experiences with some specific Christians that didn't go so well. Or for other people, maybe they just kind of hear the name Christian as just sort of like a tag or a title or something you put on a form when you have to fill out your senses kind of thing, right? But the truth is, is that the name Christian means to be like Christian. Christ. It means to be like Christ. It means to have the characteristics. It means to to do the things and be like the person of Christ. In fact, I love this passage in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. 
It says this about the disciples. It says the disciples, and those were, you know, Jesus' followers and his, his, his students, basically. And at this point, it probably was expanded to just beyond the 12 apostles to all of his followers. But it says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, it's interesting. This is one of those passages, and you know me, I like to kind of slow up and look at passages and say, now, what about some of these small things that we're just sort of running past and don't normally pay attention to? But I think it's interesting in this passage that it says that they were called Christians. You see, it doesn't say that first at Antioch, they called themselves Christians, that they let everybody know. They put up a sign out front of their building that they, you know, would refer to each other, hey, come and meet with us Christians. No, they were called Christians. That means the people around them in their city of Antioch, it means that they looked at the disciples, the followers of Jesus, and there was something about them that when people saw those followers of Jesus, that they thought of Jesus right away. It instantly made them think of that Christ person from many years ago, and it made them say, you know, those, they're just a bunch of Christians. They're just a bunch of Christ followers. But what do people think when they look at you today? When people see you, when they interact with you, when they have conversations with you, I hear some chuckles. I don't know what the chuckles are. Those are good or bad. Um, uh, what do people think? You know, maybe, maybe what, what do your, uh, you know, your coworkers think when they see you and they interact with you? Do they, do they think of um, your, your business practices? Do they think of you as a hard worker? Do they think of you as not such a hard worker? Uh, do, they, do they think of you as a jokester? Uh, there's so many different things that maybe they think of you. What does what your family think of you? What do your neighbors think of you? What do people think of you who interact with you online? You see, there are so many things in so many different places that when people look at us, they think of us in different ways. When, when people hear you speak, when they see you work, when they interact with you online, do they think, do they look at your interactions, they, do they hear your words, do they see your actions and think, man, this guy, man, this gal, they, they must be a Christian. There's just no doubting it. Well, today, today we are unveiling a brand new mission statement for Smithfield Christian Church. Today we're going to talk about a new vision, a new plan, and a new mission statement for, for this congregation. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to change what we do as a church. And truly, uh, for the most part, we're not going to notice a lot of changes um, of what we do. If anything, we're just going to kind of bring it into a, a little bit better verbiage, a little bit better statement. You know, up until this point, our mission statement has been to honor God, make disciples, and love, G or love generously. And the truth is, we're going to continue to do that. And we're going to continue to say that we're going to do that. And we're still going to be all about these three things. But we're changing our mission statement today so that it'll be something that's very clear and concise and hopefully even in inspiring things. And we want it to be a thing that falls off of our tongue. We want it to be a thing that falls off our children's tongue, something that's so easy to say and understand what it means. And so our new mission statement, and if you kind of figured it out from context clues, it's not too difficult what it's going to be. Our new mission statement is simply to love like Jesus. We want to be a people here at Smithfield Christian Church that when people look at us, they know who our hero is, right? They know who we aspire to be. We want to be the type of people that when people look at us, they don't even have to have a sign out front to let them know. They just know that we love like Jesus. We want it to be no mistaking at all. You know, as I was kind of working on this message a few weeks ago and I was thinking about, okay, well, how do we, how do we unpack this idea of loving like Jesus? There are so many different directions to go. We could try to break down what these different words mean. We could break down of how this might be played out within our church programming. We might even talk about how this is played out within our own individual lives. But I think, and, and we're probably going to do that over the next several weeks and kind of in, in different times throughout the year and over the years too. But I think probably the best way, the best thing for us to start with is just to simply answer the question, what does it mean to love like Jesus? There are some great pictures of Jesus, of his love, of his interactions, of his workings, and so many things like that in the scriptures. And this morning, we're going to look at three, what I'm going to call pictures of Jesus, three situations of Jesus that I think help us understand what it means to love like Jesus. And the thing is, the thing is, and I want, us to, I want you guys to catch this, and this is true not only for this message, but for any time we get into God's Word. The point of doing this is not for us just to look at the Bible, look at Scripture, and look at Jesus and say, man, isn't Jesus awesome? Because yeah, He is, and that's good for us to do. But the point of us doing it is not to stop there, but to then say, okay, now how can I put this into my life? How can I love like Jesus. 
And so what I want to do is I want to give you three, three phrases. There's actually three words that we're going to start with, but I want to kind of add to those words that in three phrases that I think will help us to better understand what it means to love like Jesus. The three words are in your outline, your bulletin there, forgiveness, service, and presence. And, and these words, I mean, this is very obvious. You look at these words and it's like, yeah, that's Jesus. Obviously, that's what it means. You know, that's who Jesus is. That's what he was about. But, but I think Jesus went beyond in each of these three areas and did something even more that kind of calls us to a different standard in a different way. So we're going to start by looking at that very first one. The very first, first picture we're going to see of Jesus is actually towards the end of Luke's gospel. It's actually where Jesus has already uh, been, uh, or he's, he's about to be crucified. He's at the end of his, his ministry. And we see this very first picture here in Luke chapter 23 in verse 30, 33. It says, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When was the last time that somebody harmed you? Maybe maybe physically, maybe emotionally, but when was the last time that somebody harmed you and you begged God to forgive them? I mean, think about that for a moment. I don't know about you, but when I get wronged in, in whatever manner, shape, or form, my tendency a lot of times is to get even, right? I mean, no matter how petty or how important the situation might be. You know, if someone makes a joke at my expense, well, I want to fire a zinger right back at them. Hey, you know, I got, I got some comebacks too. Someone maybe breaks a possession of mine, well, they need to replace it. They need to take care of that. And when these things happen in our life, you know, a lot of times what we had this natural tendency to is we want justice, or at least what we consider to be justice. And a lot of times when we think of that word justice, we think of basically we, we want them to hurt as much as we are hurting, or we want them to be hurt as much as we've been hurt. But what we need to understand about Jesus and about his forgiveness is that it doesn't really work that way. You see, it doesn't really work in the manner that we kind of get what we deserve before Jesus forgives us. In fact, there's a passage in Romans chapter 5 that we've talked about a lot here, and it's really such an important and powerful verse that Paul talks about the love of God demonstrated. It says this in verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. And and let me just kind of pause there for a second before we go past that comma. While we were still sinners. Sinners, And the truth is, is like, it's not only while we were still sinners, but long before you and I would become sinners, long before you and I would fall back into sin, long before you and I would say, we know better, God, we're going to do things our way. Long before that, what? Christ died for us. You see, it's not the idea that God was saying, okay, look, when, when you get your act together, when you get things in, in the right place, then we'll talk about forgiveness. And sometimes that's how we approach God. We feel like, you know, and, and a lot of times we'll say that about, you know, getting involved with church. I'll talk with folks and people will be like, oh, you know, I want to get some things straight in my life first before I go to church. And it's like, buddy, listen, you'll never get them right without Jesus. He's the one that gets you right. But the, the thing is, is that when, when Jesus looks at us in the face of our sin, Jesus shows us this. He shows us what I would call irrational forgiveness. Irrational forgiveness. Now, now look, look, before you run me out of town and before you queue up the emails and phone calls for tomorrow because I just called Jesus irrational, let me explain what I mean. The way that we work in our world with forgiveness is that, well, somebody's got to apologize to me first, right? Somebody's got to earn my forgiveness. But man, when we hear the stories of people who forgive others, even when we would consider them not really deserving forgiveness. I, I read an article about back in uh, 2015, you may have heard of this, it was a church in Charleston where a man went in into a Bible study and just shot the place up and killed several people. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing. I was watching this video, there was a rec- it had a recording of the audio um, um, of, of people speaking at the sentencing of this man who went in and shot and killed people. There were family members, there were church members that came and spoke at the sentencing of this man and they were saying, we forgive you. In fact, one man even invited this guy to their Bible study, and I'm like, what? 
You're inviting the guy that just shot the place to your Bible study? Or in, or in 2019, uh, there was a, a woman, who, a, a mother, whose son was, was murdered by another man, by another young man in his 20s. And she got to speak at his sentencing uh, hearing as well. And she said, she said, as a mother, I can't help but look at my son's killer, this young man in his 20s, and just want to hug him because something just isn't right. And I'm like, man, are you kidding me? You see, that's the kind of irrational forgiveness that Jesus offers to each one of us. Even to the mur- his murderers who were nailing him to a cross, and he offers it to you and me. So how do we offer this kind of forgiveness for others? When people wrong you, when a family member breaks your heart, when a, stealer, when a, when a stranger steals from you, or when a stranger hurts you, or, or will, will you, will you fight to get justice, or will you offer that same kind of irrational forgiveness? You see, the reason, that we, the reason that we need to offer this kind of forgiveness, the same kind of forgiveness that we've been given from Jesus, is that it brings about a change of heart. What I mean is, think, think for a second, put yourself in the situation of the herder person, the person that hurts someone else, the person that needs forgiveness. When, when we harm someone in whatever manner, shape, or fashion, when we receive that forgiveness— before we've, we've made things right, at least in our own mind, man, it, it does something is in, to us inside. It kind of challenges us and says, I, I need to change. I need to do something about these things. You see, when, friends, when we offer irrational forgiveness to other people, it stirs something within them and causes them to want to make a change, the same kind of change that Christ makes within us. The second pic- picture of what it means to, to love like Jesus. We're actually going to back up from his crucifixion and kind of go a little bit just a few days before that to where he's with his disciples and they're sharing in the Passover meal together. And this is in John's gospel in chapter 13 now in verse 2. It says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. I have preached on this passage. I've taught on this passage. I I can't tell you how many times. But every single time I come to this passage, I read it on my own, I am drawn to something that really just kind of slaps me in the face. It's, It's what Jesus knows before he does this act of service. I mean, the act of service by itself, okay, he's washing these guys' feet. And you, you remember, they, they wear sandals, they walk around, they're probably pretty gross. And then that in and of itself, that's pretty amazing. That's the service side. But Jesus does something a little bit more. You see, he goes and he, he, he knows a few things as he is about to do this. There's actually four things that John kind of points out that Jesus knows. First of all, he knows that Judas has already made a decision that he's going to betray Jesus. He's already made this plan. And Jesus already knows that. And he also knows that Peter is going to deny him three times. And he also knows that the rest of his disciples are just going to desert him and are going to run away and hide. So he knows that. But he also knows that, that God had given him, it said that God had given him all power, had put all things under his power. So he knows that he's not just some guy, but he's got God's power. But then the other thing he knows, the third thing he knows, is that he was from God. He knows that he is God's son. He's not just some teacher, not just some rabbi. But then the fourth thing he also knew was that he was about to go back to his father. He was about to leave all this mess, all this craziness. And so with those things in mind, what does Jesus do? Well, I know what I would do. If I knew that my friends were about to betray me, if I knew that I had all power, if I knew that I was God's son, if I knew that I was about to leave these jerks and head back home, well, I'd probably give them a piece of my mind. I'd probably finally tell them everything I wanted to say to them. Maybe if I was God, I'd zap them with a few lightning bolts or whatever. But I would probably not do what Jesus does here. And that's why he's Jesus. And that's why we need to be like him. Jesus does the job that no one else does. I mean, there's no, there should be a servant there, but there's not. And no one gets up to do the job that's supposed to be done before this meal. And so Jesus, God's son, humbles himself. And Jesus shows selfless service. And the selfless part, that, that's really key for this. Because I think, I think we're all willing to help and serve at times. 
I mean, yeah, we're willing to, you know, kind of do our part and kind of chip in here and there. But more often than not, it's usually only when it's convenient or when it's easy or when it's painless or when it doesn't cost me much. Even though uh, we're helping others and even though we're serving others, a lot of times we do it on our own terms, which really doesn't make it about them. It makes it about us. Maybe you get a call from someone um, needing some help. Maybe you have a person stop by your house or stop you at work or whatever, and they want to talk about a situation. Maybe you see a person struggling to do something on their own. And too many times our natural tendency is to maybe think, well, let me finish what I'm doing, or let me go and do what I've got to get done, or maybe after I'm done with my work, or maybe once I do whatever and things are okay, or once I've paid off this, then I can help in that way. And too many times, I think, you know, we are waiting more about and more worried about getting our stuff accomplished and our stuff done, and then we can kind of fit everybody else in in the gaps and when there's a little bit of extra space. But look, I'm not saying that we throw our schedules and our lives out the window and we're just at everybody's beckoning call. But I want you to hear how Paul describes Jesus' selfless service uh, in Philippians. This is in chapter 2. It says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus, or of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I heard one pastor preaching about this, about this passage once, and he was talking about this whole struggle that we go through, you know, when we see somebody in need or we hear about somebody in need, but we got stuff going on in our life. What he has started to do, I think, is a, is a really great practice that I'd suggest that we pull into our own life, is he begins to ask the question, God, is this one for me? God, is this my assignment? God, are you trying to tell me something? Is this one for me? You see, he simply stops and he asks. He doesn't ask the question, do I have time? He doesn't ask the question, do I have money? Do I have the energy? Do I have the resources? He simply asks, God, is this one for me? And again, when we do that, it takes the spotlight off of us and it puts it back onto someone else. And again, they're not all going to be for us, but who knows? Maybe God has put you in that place. Maybe God has put that person in that place because this one is for you. And Jesus, he shows us selfless service. The last picture I want us to see of what it means to love like Jesus, we're going to go even a little bit further back in Jesus' life. We're going to go back um, um, into the very third chapter of Mark. Um, He says this in verse 14. It says, he, being Jesus, appointed 12 that they might be with him. So this is where Jesus is kind of picking some people to be with him, some disciples to, to spend time with him. And I think it's interesting how Mark puts this here of calling these disciples. It says he chose 12 that they might be with him. It doesn't say he chose 12 close friends. It doesn't say 12 people to learn from him or to serve with him or to lead with him. It says 12 to be with him. And that's really what they did. I mean, they were with Jesus all the time. When he taught, they heard it. When he healed, they saw it. When he rebuked, they received some of it. When he served, they helped. They spent pretty much three whole years together with Jesus. Then there's another passage that if you jump all the way to the book of Acts, you know, you go from the life of Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then we go into the book of Acts, and we see the start of the church, and we see uh, God, is, or Jesus has returned back to God in heaven, and, and, and as he's sending his disciples out, and as they're going and taking the message of what Jesus has done for us into the world, they, they kind of come into some opposition, and sometimes the religious leaders don't like what they're teaching and don't like what they're doing, and, it, and sometimes they would kind of bring them in for questioning or arrest them. And there's one situation where this happens uh, to Peter and John, and, and this is in Acts chapter four. And, and this is where they're, they're questioning them and they're grilling them like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And so it says this in verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were uns- unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You see, these religious leaders, they, they saw something in these guys. And maybe it was the way that they talked. Maybe it was the way that they acted. Maybe it was the way that they served or loved, but it made it really obvious that these guys had been with Jesus. You see, the third characteristic of what it means to love like Jesus is life-changing presence. Life-changing presence. Now, sure, it's easy to say, well, that's just, you know, Jesus. Of course, he's going to change your life. You know, when he comes into our life, he changes everything. You know, when God sends his Holy Spirit to, to dwell in us, to live in us, man, it changes us. And, and if you and I, if, if you've given your life to Christ, you know what that's like. You're, you're not the person that you once were. But you and I, I really believe that we can have a similar effect on others. I mean, we rarely consider what kind of effects our presence could make on someone else's life and how it even could be life-changing. I want you to think for a moment. I want you to think of those people or maybe that person who has made that kind of life change in you 
just because of their presence, just because of them stepping into your life. Maybe it was someone who stepped into your life early on and spent time with you. Maybe it was someone that has recently done that. Maybe it was someone who had been there for a long time or just a short amount of time. And that's not to say that you are like, you know, joined at the hip with them, you're constantly with them, your best friends, all that stuff. Maybe again, it's for a short season, maybe it's for a long season. But, but I believe that all of us can look at our life and we can see when people step into our life and we can see a noticeable change. There have been several in my life, several people that have stepped in my life. When I, I shared before um, that my now cousin through marriage, um, my, my former uh, pastor when I was a kid, uh, when I was a teenager, he saw something in me and took me under his wing. We used to joke, we weren't sure if he thought I was mature or if he was just immature. We'll go with a little bit of both maybe. Uh, but, but something there, you know, we connected somehow and he spent time with me. And because of him, and because of his presence in my life, it changed who I was. Many of you know our friend John Moore, and I've heard so many people talk about uh, his demeanor and his character and just who he is when he spent his short amount of time with us here at Smithville Christian Church. Uh, just the impact he's had on so many. I look around the room at a lot of you folks, and I think of the person that I have changed into, the person that I've grown into because of friendships and relationships with each of you. You see, we cannot take for granted the opportunity that we have to potentially affect the life of another person forever when we step into their life. Now, we don't need to get a big head and think, well, I want to get to hang out with you today and change their life. You know, that's not the case or whatever. You know, we're not like, people, who am I going to impact it? No, no, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about who God is using us to make a difference in. The Holy Spirit working in and through us. You see, because really, we're told that's really the whole point of why God comes and works through us is so that we can then go and do that same thing with someone else. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this in chapter 1. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You see, friends, God steps into our lives through other people. And he comforts us and disciplines us and leads us and guides us. And those people, they leave an undeniable mark on our life. But it's one of those marks that we then need to pass on to someone else. We can do the same thing for other people with the words that we speak, with the time that we spend with them. You see, it's not about fixing people. It's not about figuring out all their problems. It's just simply making yourself available to be a, a tool for God, just to be there for them, to be involved and to be connected. You see, we were created for relationships. We were created for connections. And that's what God wants us to do with other people. He wants us to have life-changing presence. He wants us to have selfless service and irrational forgiveness. You know, we have out in our foyer there, there is a heart, a large wooden heart, with a bunch of little hearts on it. And it's interesting because about this time last year, I got up here on stage and I had it here with me, and I talked about what we were going to do with this heart. And I talked about how, man, we're going to go out and we're going to love Smithfield, and we started this new initiative called SEC Love Smithfield, and we're going to go and serve Smithfield, and we're going to love Smithfield, and we're going to go out there and be in, be in people's lives and you know, be up close and personal and serve people. And then a pandemic hit, and it's like, well, thank you very much. And in some ways, you can feel like, well, you know, that was a total flop, but that was a total failure. But the thing is, if you go out there, you'll see that that thing is covered with those hearts. And the whole point of that heart was that every time you and I we have an opportunity to share the love of Christ, or as we say now, to love like Jesus, we take one of those heart stickers and we put it on that wooden heart, and we fill that thing up, and it's a visual representation of the opportunities that you and I have had to love like Jesus. And so, friends. I want to challenge you. As we start into this new year, as we start in with this, this new mission statement, I want to challenge you to get on board with this, to find ways that you can love like Jesus, find ways that you can be in people's lives, be present with them, to serve people, to forgive people, and to love like Jesus. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you for your love. I want to thank you for the, the love that you brought in my life because of other people and the way that you've ministered to me. God, I pray, I pray for each person in this room. Maybe there was something that popped in their mind as you looked at those pictures of your son and the way that he loved. Lord, would you, would you stir within us these opportunities and a, and a realization of how and when we can practice loving like your son, loving like Jesus. Lord, may we, may, may we never take for granted the love we've been given. Lord, may we always extend it out to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.